family it's time to prepare for worship but just before we prepare for worship I want to just bring a few things before your mind before your heart some things to be concerned about by prayer some things to be excited about by preparation and some things just to practically know as we move forward listen we have been having a marvelous time and some tremendous move of God or watching rather the tremendous move of God through the efforts that we put forward in being kingdom forward, being intentional about the kingdom of God. Uh, from our salt and light table of blessing ministry, God has blessed this congregation to be able to uh, invite and reach out to over 300 some of our people in just a month and a half of effort, of actual effort. The only reason we can do that is because we have people of God who are interested in serving. There have been members of the body of Christ that have purchased and been a part of feeding and um, blessing other, other individuals by donating specifically for the table of blessing. Many of you have brought groceries and brought those, those uh, items that have been a blessing for the outreach effort. As a result of it, we now have a standing line of members in the community who are coming to receive the blessings. And as they come to receive the blessings, they are thankful. We've been celebrated publicly by individuals that have walked past where we worship and where we, where we outreach and literally said, thank you for being a blessing to this community. You ought to be commended. Continue to do those things that are, allow for the community to be blessed by the work that we're doing. Continue to be a part of reaching out by way of 
helping with the table of blessing. Continue to be a part of praying for those that have been uh, uh, invited to be a part of our worship. To date, we've now invited over 75 people to be a part of our virtual worship, and people are responding to me. Personally, many of them have been a part of uh, the growing number that's increased in our virtual worship, and so we thank God for that. It's not because of who we are. It's not because of what, what we've done. It's all about the move of God, and we want to thank God for that. In addition to that, you'll know, you'll see at this point the renovation efforts that have been taking place. And I especially want to take a moment and, and give God glory and praise for the many men who've been behind the scenes working uh, and, and, and doing their part in bringing this facility back to a place where it can be useful. We had a great deal of mold that needed to be removed. We had a number of things when we pulled back the cover that were harmful to the facility. And we, we, we thank God for their patient work. And we thank you for being patient while they work. So take a look at the renovations. Look at what's being done in the bathroom area. Look at what's being done in what formerly was known as the fellowship area. That area has been opened up. It is now being uh, sheet rocked and, and, and finished. The lighting has been changed. The kitchen area has been opened up so that we can use that area to do even more work for God. That's the real purpose of the facility. The purpose of the facility is not to be worshipped, nor is it to be considered a holy place where God is necessarily there. God is everywhere. We know that. The primary use of that building is to be an outreach center, a place where the people of God huddle and then do work for God. And so keep that in your mind as we are patiently waiting and patiently watching the work that's being done. Take a look at these renovation pictures. Do, do me a favor. Keep praying for Brother Hunter. Keep praying for Brother Kunji. Keep praying for those men that are working to, to get this work done so that we can continue to get God's work done done. Did you catch that? Keep praying for them that are getting the work done so that we can continue to get more work done. Remember, this building is a tool being used by the people of God in the hands of God to accomplish the kingdom of God. And that's what it's all about. So we've got a lot to be prayerful for. We have a lot to thank God that he is preparing us for. And then practically speaking, we want to continue to move forward, continue to be sacrificial, give in a way that you know that your worship to God, that's why you give, is being an extension of the voice and the gospel and the hand and outreach of God. That's why we're able to do what we're able to do because of worshipers just like you, because of disciples just like you. Even right now, because of what we're doing, there are individuals that are even are not necessarily a part of our congregation that are giving, folk from outside that are contributing to the work that we're doing. And we want to continue to be salt and light after all. It's not about us patting ourselves on the back and celebrating more of who we are. It's about helping God to be realized in the hearts of individuals who are looking for Jesus, who are looking for the solution for why they're here, who are looking for the purpose of their existence. And that's why we do what we do. So keep being sacrificial. Keep being a servant. Keep being prayerful. And right now in this season, keep being patient. God is moving God is working. God is preparing a place for you and I to continue to reach out in behalf of God. Let's prepare for worship even right now. It's time for worship right now. Put everything away. Put your cornflakes away. Put your eggs away. Put that toast away. Go on ahead and get everything ready. It, it, this is not the time for you to run up in here trying to finish up all the last little bit of your breakfast before worship. It's time for worship. Put it all away because now we want to meet with God. We want to celebrate with God. We want to worship with God and we want to do it even right now. I'm going to invite God to be a part of our worship. Listen, the Bible says, in Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Let's prepare to invite our God to be a part of our worship as we give him everything that makes 
him what he is and everything that helps us to realize who he is. Let's give him our song. Let's give him our prayers. Let's give him our heart as we meet him in communion. Let's give him our mind as we meet him through the word. Let's give him respect as we give to him in worship and in praise. Let's invite God to be with us right where we are. Remember that you can't outrun the presence of God. So since that's the case, we are collectively joining together in thought and in intent and inviting God to be with us even right now. Let's pray together. Father, we bless love and thank you so much for being our God. We worship you and thank you. And we ask, Father, even right now, we invite and invoke and beg you to be with us. Be with us, Father God, as we prepare our hearts to give you worship. Be with us as we prepare our souls to, to be turned over to you. Be with us, Father God, as our intent and our mind and our, and our very focus is lean towards you. Lord, we love you and thank you for all of what you've done. Thank you for King Jesus that makes this time of worship possible. Thank you, Father, for the amazing things that you are continuing to do in our hearts, in our minds, and in our spirit. God, we pray that as we continue to give ourselves over to you in worship, give ourselves over to you in devotion, give ourselves over to you, Lord God, in all of what we've done, that you will be glorified, you will be magnified, that you will be lifted up, and you will be praised. Father, take our song and be pleased with it. Take our prayer and hear us, Lord God. Take our minds and shape them. Take our offering and continue to extend your, your kingdom glory and do what, it, what, what, what needs to be done, Father, for your name's sake. Father, take everything that makes us who we are so that you will be lifted up. You will be glorified. You will be magnified. We give ourselves away to you, Father, so that you can use us. We ask all of this, Father. We invite you and we beg all of this in the name of Jesus and his and in his name we together say and we together pray amen and amen let's worship the lord i want to be
If I had one plea, if I had one plea, it would be Jesus keeping me near the cross, near the cross. At your cross, there's forgiveness. At your cross, there is mercy. At your cross, there is love. Our eternal Father in heaven, Father, we thank you for your word. For you spoke your word and it brought forth the earth. You spoke your word and it brought the sunshine. You spoke the word and it brought the, the living beings. And Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to call you our Father by the death of your Son. Father, we're grateful for the price that was paid for our salvation. And Father, we just pray that you might be with us in a very special way. Help us, Father, to reach out to those who have not embraced the truth, that they will see Christ in our lives and investigate that truth before it's ever less or too late. Father, we pray that you might be with us this evening, this morning, in a very special way. Be with each family. Be with each home, Heavenly Father. Be with those, Heavenly Father, who have not embraced the truth. Father, pray, pray that you might be with them in a very special way, they, they soon will know that you are the one that uh, brought forth uh, everything in life. And Father, we just pray that you help us always be mindful of the blessing we have received from our early existence, even to this present moment. Father, bless us, Heavenly Father. Bless us, those people who are going through some health problems at this time. And Father, be with those who are uh, suffering from the uh, the virus, pray for us, you might be with them in a very special way. They will not give up. But Father, we pray that you might be with our world at large, be with the leadership of the, of the country. Father, pray that they will lead the way that you be pleased with. And Father, help us to be unified in, in, in serving you for the rest of our life. Father, be with those heavens, Father, who have lost ones before the, because of the virus. But Father, comfort them as only you can comfort them. But Father, we thank you for this time you brought us together. Help us, Father, to be mindful of them, all those things that we take for granted. But Father, we just thank you for your grace, for your mercy. In his name we do pray. Amen.
it is time for communion. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 through 29. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take heed, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the mountain of Olives. I've just read from Matthew 26, 26 to verse 30. Communion. Communion speaks to the spiritual union shared by all Christians. Because Christians are united by the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ, communion has come to represent the act of remembering Christ. Sacrifice through the drinking of the fruit and the vine and the breaking of bread. Let us pray for the emblems. Heavenly most right, gracious God, blessed and sanctify this bread which represent the broken body of your Son and the fruit of the vine which represent the shed blood. May we eat and drink in remembrance of him and do this in a manner that is pleasing to you. Amen.
We have come to the portion of this service where we are offering back to our Father a portion of what he has given us. In Scripture we have Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 10. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. I will also be reading from John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Our basic trust is to always remember that worship is through giving, and this is the one occasion in which we get to look most like God. It is here at this very moment that we reflect on his giving tendency, which was to give his first, his best, and out of the spirit of love. We show through our giving that we love God enough with our first to trust him with the rest. Let us pray. Father God, we are incredibly grateful and thankful for your love your mercy, your kindness. We pray to emulate or model your love in return with our offering. We thank you for providing and sustaining us and our families. We pray that the funds collected will help us in our efforts to share your word and your love. In Christ's name we do pray, Father God. Amen. Amen. If anybody has a reason to sing, we do.
What's happening, family? It's time to continue our worship through the celebration, investigation, and application of the Word of God. We believe that God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Psalm 119, verse 105. We believe that God's Word ought to be laid up in our heart so that we don't sin against our Creator. Psalm 119, verse Number 11, we believe that God's word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul, spirit, joint, and marrow, and it is a discerner of the very thought and intent of the heart. Hebrews 4 and verse number 12, we believe that God's word ought to be learned so that what it promises can be recognized and looked for knowing that it will not get back to God void. Isaiah 55 verse 11 and 12. We believe that God's word ought to be listened to and then lived out so that we're not guilty of being a people who stand before the mirror of the word of God, see the areas of deficit, but then go our way and forget what manner of man or woman that we are. James chapter 1 verse number 21 through 22 and following. And we believe that life itself is built on the word of God because Jesus said, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And so we come to celebrate, we come to investigate, and we come to apply what thus saith the Lord, knowing that life itself is built on the word of God. We've been working in our overall emphases of continuing the things that Jesus began to do and teach out of the book of Acts. We believe that we are the extension, the ongoing application of everything our Lord did and everything our Lord taught. We are Acts chapter 29, the continuation of the acts of Jesus in a world that needs him desperately. And one of the things we've been focusing on as of late is the emphasis that God gives us on being a people who live in our purpose, living in our purpose by loving on purpose. And one of the expressions of love, one of the greatest pictures of love in Christianity is in the unity of the move of God as seen in the New Testament church. And that can only occur when disciples are practicing living out the nature of their Lord. When we do things in such a way where we are living to, 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 to realize exactly what our King of Kings and Lord of Lords did, did then we are, we are practical pictures of what, what love and what unity and what purpose is all about. And I want to do just that. I want to look at a text today that gives us at least six things that we can do so that we can become the type of people who can practice what it means to be unified and live in such a way where the world sees Jesus by seeing the church. But the world sees the church clearly by seeing disciples who want to live for Jesus. Let me put a disclaimer out here, even right now. I'm not talking to everybody. I'm not speaking to everyone. I am speaking to those who desire to be disciples. I am speaking to those who desire to be followers of King Jesus, individuals who've made it their aim that they want to live under the comprehensive rule of King Jesus and every facet of their life is given dictation by what our God says. Uh, listen to me. I mean, every aspect of your life, what you do, what you think, where you work, how you function, all of it comes under the comprehensive rule of God. If, if, if we can be a kind of people that will respond by placing everything that makes us who we are at the feet of King Jesus and allowing King Jesus to have the rule over everything that we do, everything that we think, everything that we say, everything that we are, then truly we can inculcate and then actualize what it means to say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, Matthew chapter 16, to confess him above every name, to, to bow the knee before King Jesus, Matthew chapter 10, Philippians chapter 2, when it really means the confession is more than what you say before you dipped in water, but confession means that every part of my life has been brought under your rule and I live in such a way where you 
are glorified. And I will do my level best to be a part of a people who are living under your rule and demonstrating what unity is. And when you can see a unified group of people, there is nothing that they cannot do for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is no ministry, no activity, no service, no agenda that people who come together for King Jesus that they cannot accomplish. Why? Because they have submitted themselves under the Lord. They are coming together as individuals and what they do together is a representation of what they've done on their own. And if you get right under God, imagine what it looks like when every other disciple has made it their aim to come under his rule. We then are a group of people who live in such a way where God is glorified and the people of God all around him become magnified as we serve in such a way that replicates the power of our king. Now, first Peter, can y'all quit playing? Quit playing. First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. I want to read two verses out of first Peter chapter three, but then we want to unpack at least six particular principles out of first Peter chapter three that helps us to realize what it means to be a people who have made it their aim to, to, to live in such a way where our lives are expressions of the unity of of our God. Remember again that one of the goals, one of the things that God wants to see is a church that will reflect, a church that will emulate the love of God, but that can only come together if there is a church that represents the unity of God, but that can only come together if there are disciples who are living for King Jesus. Now one more time is this disclaimer, I'm not talking to everybody. I'm talking to those who want to be disciples. And if you want to be a disciple, pull up your chair, hear Peter, hear the spirit of God, hear God's word, speak to your spirit as we all make it our aim to do what God would have us to do. Watch what Peter says. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. That's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and verse number 9. Now out of that text, what Peter does is he allows us to see six particular principles, six, un six unique aspects that help us to inculcate what it means to live out uh, the nature and the character of our Lord. I want to read that same text to you out of the easy to read version of the Bible, just so you can hear, hear the terms magnified out of, the, out of a dynamic paraphrase. Now, I want to say this to you before I finish my letter. All of you should agree with each other in what you think. You should try to understand how other people are feeling. Live or love each other as brothers and sisters. Be kind to each other. Do not think that you are more important than other people. If people do bad things to you, do not do anything bad to them in return. If people say bad things against you, do not say bad things back to them. Instead, pray that God will be good to those people. That is what God wants you to do then you also will receive good things from God. Notice out of this text again, he gives six different principles to apply to our life in order for us to see what it means to live in our purpose by loving on purpose. And that greatest expression of love comes from a unified church. What are the ingredients of a unified church? Well, number one, they are harmonious, harmonious. Right out of the text, out of, out of the New American Standard, the first term he says is all of you be harmonious. In other words, all of you be together, be unified. The first essential ingredient in a unified church is unity. No one can live the Christian life in such a way where unity is not their number one agenda. No one can capture, no one can live the Christian life without a unity in their personal relationships with their fellow man. Church cannot be Christian without unity. Did you hear what I just said? You cannot claim to be a church that belongs to Christ. You cannot claim to be the church of Christ and there not be unity. In other words, if you are not a part of 
keeping the peace of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 3. If you are not a part of becoming one with your fellow man, if you are not a part of being a part of the body that's in agreement and in harmony, not some disrespectful, not some disease, not some sick member of the body that's causing swelling and pain and aching by being disconnected and discord and obstinate and arrogant. No, I mean what Jesus said. Can you hear Jesus describing what unity looks like with the people of God? He said in John chapter 17, Father, neither pray out for these alone, but for all of them which will believe on me through their word, that they all might be one. Watch him describe unity as I Father, art in thee and thou in me, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Jesus, what are you saying? I'm saying I want them to be so one, so connected, so together that they look like we look where the Father is beefing with the Son and the Son has no animosity against the Father and the Spirit and the Father and the Son are so together that when people think of God, they can only hear God say Deuteronomy chapter 6, hear O oh Israel, the Lord your God is one God because you can only see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working together to be one. Paul preached. Paul preached unity. Paul prayed for unity. Paul pleaded for unity. You go back and read. Please go back and read Romans chapter 12. Read it in its entirety. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Read it completely through and what you will find is that over and over again Paul metaphorically describes the, the, the dynamic picture of unity as a body. We need to be like a body. A hand that will function properly on an arm. A foot that will function properly on a leg. A, 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 the, 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 everything about the body working in unison together. Not some part of the body saying, I don't care what the rest say I'm going to do what I want to say because the body does not do what it wants to do. It does what the head tells it to do. And when Jesus gives us our agenda, our goal is to not make it about us, not make it about individuals, but to make it all about the king. And when you are not in line with the agenda of the king, you make the body dysfunctional, divided, discord and diseased. And God wants us in this text to be harmonized. Paul, Peter, Peter would give his first illustration of what it takes for us to be that church. He gives it on the heels of looking at family. And he gives these metaphors in conjunction with Paul that we ought to be unified like a strong, healthy family, unified, unified like a strong, healthy body. And here Jesus, unified like the Godhead three, he places unity first, but then he goes right underneath it and helps us. How can I be unified with you? How can you be unified with me? Number two, then be sympathetic, sympathetic. Sympathy is number two. What does he mean by sympathy? Notice sympathetic and selfishness cannot coexist. If I'm going to be sympathetic, then my effort in understanding who you are and understanding how you are and understanding why you are and understanding what you are means that I have to leave who I am to know you. I've got to get beyond myself and be interested in who you are by the ability that I give in listening to your story, knowing your narrative, understanding who you are. Watch again. You cannot be sympathetic and selfish at the same time. If life is lived where it's all about you. I want what I want when I want what I want, how I want what I want, then you can't be sympathetic to the next man. Sympathy demands time. Sympathy demands understanding. Sympathy demands a certain selflessness. Sympathy means that I leave who I am to get to know who you are. And why in the world would I leave who I am to know who you are? Because it reminds me of my Lord. He left heaven to come to earth just to show me the way. And in like fashion, whenever I introduce myself into the life and the span of someone else's existence, and I take time to hear them, time to listen, time to understand what's going on, and I can mute my ambition, mute what I want, mute how I want it, mute or put that 
on Paul so that I can get to know you and understand you. I am practicing sympathetically hearing you. Then number three, I need to practice being brotherly. Now, Peter uses a term. He, he brings in love a number of times in his letter. You go back and read the letter all the way through. He brings in love for the first time in chapter one and verse number 22. He'll bring it up again in chapter two. He brings it up here in chapter three, in four, and also in five. In every chapter, he has some picture of love, but here he's using it in an interesting way. He describes love in a familiar way, a familiar way, not necessarily agape love, not necessarily a love that is the decisive love that we read about where Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you that you have love one for another. But here he brings in another aspect of it. He will use agape love through the letter, but here he brings in a different dynamic where he talks about brotherly love, a brotherly love in which what I'm doing is putting flesh on my proclamation, putting flesh on what I say I do. I say I love you. I say that you are my brother. I say that we're in this together. Watch, 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 because we're real good. We know that we're really good at talking about being Christian. We're really good at talking about the things of God. We know real well how to, how to speak fluent Christianese. Y'all already know this. We can, we can fill in the blank. God is good. Somebody says all the time and all the time God is good. We know how to do all of the Christianese. We know how to go through the antics of talking about who we are. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. Isn't God good? God is good. We can go through all of that stuff. God will fix it. God loves you. God bless you. It's going to be all right. Right, man, God is going to do this and God is going to do that. Listen to me. It's one thing to talk about God. It's one thing to talk about the things of God. It's one thing to say that you know the biblical rhetoric, but it's a whole nother thing to allow the Bible to become real in your life in which you live in such a way where when I call you my brother, that means more than biology it means more than my, 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 my makeup. It means that I am literally putting flesh on the concept of love. When I love you like my brother and my sister, look, watch, watch God take that concept a step further. I love my brother. I love my sister, my actual brother and my actual sister. But God calls me to raise the level of my paternal, of my fraternal love for my siblings and love in such a way where I look like brother Jesus loving my brother and my sister. Y'all missed it. You missed it. You missed it. When we love brotherly, we inculcate the nature of who the king of kings is, brother Jesus, and we take on brother Jesus' mind and love each other like Jesus loved us. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means if I really say I love my brother, I'm not going to assassinate his character behind his back. I'm not going to let somebody else talk bad about my brother. I'm not going to speak evil of my brother. If I really love my brother, I will do my level best to live for them. And I will even die for you. I owe you that kind of love. Somebody says that don't make no sense. That's radical. That's ridiculous. I ain't going to just tell. I, I, I said I'm not talking. I'm not talking to everybody. I'm talking to disciples and disciples have made up in their mind that they will die. I will die. For my brother, I owe you. I will die for you. I know, I know, I know, I know we have times where we don't agree, but I will die for you. Why? Because I believe in the unity of the kingdom. I will die on behalf of you. I will defend you to the death. To the death. Why in the world would you do such a crazy thing? That don't make no natural sense. You're absolutely right. It's a supernatural concept, which is why only a disciple will live in application of it. I'm not making this up. First John, come over to the Bible. First John chapter four. Watch first John chapter four. Watch what the Bible says in first John chapter four and verse number 20. First John chapter four, verse number 20. Watch what the text says in verse number 19. Verse number 19. We love. Because he first loved us. He who? Brother Jesus. If someone says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother brother 
also. Peter, Peter is just saying what John says, and John is saying what the Holy Spirit says, and the Holy Spirit is reminding us what Jesus did. Love each other. How? 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 Intensely. Brotherly love. When you, when you talk about brotherly love, you're not talking about regular kind of love. You can only love your brother like your brother Jesus loved you. First John chapter 3. Go back one chapter. Watch this. First John chapter 3, verse number 15, 16, 17. Matter of fact, start at verse, start at verse number 14. We know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Wait, 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 watch, because it gets even deeper. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Watch what, God, watch what John does. John gives us another practical way of seeing how this love works. Notice how it works. In, in, in a real simple illustration, I owe it to you. I owe it to you to love you. I owe it to you to lay down my life for you. I owe it. Why would you say I owe it? Well, that's what happened to me. Jesus laid down his life for me, so I owe it to you. And if I'm really going to love like my brother loves and practice brotherly love, then I will die for you. Oh, how do you demonstrate dying for somebody else? Look, if I got it and you need it, it's yours. If I have the ability and it's a need for the body, it's yours. If I have the expertise and it's a need for the well-being of the body, it's yours. I'm not going to leave my brother held hostage and claim I love you. I can't claim I love you and do nothing. If I love you, I'm going to do what God has blessed me, gifted me, resourced me to do for you. Why? Because I can't let you die. I can't let you be without. Because if I do so, it's a lie for what I claim I have for God. How can you say you love your brother who you see? And you, you, how can you claim to love God whom you can't, you don't see and you, you don't love your brother who you see every single day? Notice 1 John 3, 16 one more time. If I love you, then I'll die for you. And I'll die for you because I owe it to you. I owe it to you because that's what God did for me. See that brotherly love then says, I'm going to put up with you. I'm going to be patient with you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pardon you, but I'm going to protect you. I'm going to do my best for you. That helps you with number four on the list. Be harmonious. Be sympathetic. Be brotherly. Number four, be kind-hearted. Kind-hearted is another powerful term, similar to sympathetic, but he takes it a step further. Kind-hearted is a term that describes compassion. And compassion is the divine hurt that God gives you, that guttural level feeling of discomfort that you have when someone's life is being violated by the terms of existence. When, when you know that someone is in need and something needs to be done, you hurt that they're hurting, you hurt from their lack, and you just cannot sit and let them go without something that they need. That's compassion. Compassion is what the people of God, it is the energy behind your ache. It is, the, it is the thing that moves you when you hurt over someone else's hurting. When I see that you are in need, my compassion moves me to do something. I can't let you be hungry. I can't let you be naked. I can't let you be without. If I got it, you got it. Because my compassion moves me. It hurts me. I see you like Jesus I see you, Matthew chapter 9. You're like sheep. You've been harassed. You've been hurt. You've been, you've been struggling. You're like sheep without a shepherd. I've got to do something. I see you like Luke 10, like the Samaritan where everybody's passing by someone who's been brutalized, someone who's been hurt. He's been robbed. He's been left naked. He's half dead. And I see a priest passing him by. And I see a Levite passing him by. I can't pass you by. I've got to do something. I see you hungry. I see you in need. I see you don't have a place to stay. My compassion says I've got to do something. Compassion will move you. If you really care about the things of God, you can't let God's people, you can't let your community, you can't let the world go without. You can't sit on the sideline and be okay 
with things not turning out for a win for God. But then that takes number five. That takes real humility. You understand what humility means? As Peter uses humility, he just, he marries into the term, the same concept that's used all throughout the New Testament. And that notion of humility all throughout the New Testament ought to be described as who you are. When people think of the a, a child of God. When people think of a kingdom citizen, they ought to they ought to say, you know what? One one thing I know about them is that they're humble. Now, how do people of God practice humility? People of God practice humility really from two major aspects. Number one, they recognize that they are creatures made by the Creator. That's number one. And when you can think and you can frame your mind around the fact that you are nothing but another speck of dust in a universe made by the hands and the artistry and the architecture of God himself. When you can see that you are nothing significant, that it is not about you, that this whole world and everything in it has nothing to do with what you have done. It makes you small. And that smallness is what you need to understand the world around you. How dare you ever start thinking that you're more than what you are. We are all, as Isaiah would say, on our best days, filthy rags, nothing. We are humble. And I hear somebody right now pushing back because their Americanized mentality of Christianity won't allow them to say, I am nothing. No, I am, I am somebody. God made me somebody. Yeah, I got you, but it's the same God who said, be humble, be humble. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, your creator. And the only reason you are something is when God raises you up. But even then, it's God who raises you up. That's why you got to have number one clearly in your mind. I am nothing without you, God. I ain't nothing till you call me something. You're humble. But then in addition to that mentality that I'm a creature made by God, a second understanding of the term humble is that I am broken. I am fallen. I don't get it right. I am not perfect. I am a sinner. I am in the process of being remade. I am in recovery every single day. That's why Paul would say in Philippians chapter two, let no man esteem himself better than somebody else, but esteems, esteem others better than yourself. Look not only for your own needs, but for other people. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And if your Lord, if your creator humble himself, to serve the creature, then surely this creature who's made by the hands and the artistry and the architecture of the King of Kings would have enough sense to humble themselves as they minister to other people. You won't practice being compassionate, being brotherly, being sympathetic, or being in harmony with someone else without humility grabbing your heart. Part of the reason why churches and people and units and families everywhere struggle as they do is because there's a lack of humility. But if we can practice lowering our mentality, lower the lower you can stay in spirit, the easier it becomes to sacrifice, the easier it becomes to surrender, the easier it becomes to serve, the easier it becomes to submit to God, the arrogant Proud, egocentric will always fail and play the part of Satan in any constellation that they're in. Did you catch what I just said? Please hear it again. The arrogant, the proud, the egocentric will always fail and play the part of Satan in any sort of constellation that they're in when they are not humble. You can always tell when somebody's wrestling with humility because they will isolate, they will do things that won't be sacrificial, they won't surrender to the will of God, they won't serve alongside someone else, they won't guard themselves with the towel. They won't submit to the will of God. They will fight everything that God would have them to fight. And they will be obstinate, disagreeable. They won't be individuals who will be in harmony like Acts 4 and verse number 32 describes the people of God. And that's our agenda, that we are so together that nothing is our own. And we live in such a way where the community and the world around us says this is the people of God. These are representations of Jesus. And I can tell by the way they love each other. 
by the way they are sympathetic, by the way they are brotherly, by the way they are kind-hearted, compassionate, by the way they are humble, and the way number six, the way they forgive. Notice verse number nine of the text one more time. I'm going to go back to that one because I want to make sure that you hear it. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you will call for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. The, the Passion Translation says, never retaliate when someone treats you wrongly, nor insult those who insult you, but instead respond by speaking a blessing over them because a blessing is what God promised to give you. The sixth aspect here, this sixth element that becomes ingredients for how we can be a unified people of God, a unified picture of the body of Christ is that we are forgiving, that we are those who bless, forgive when we've been wrong who forgive and, and don't retaliate, but we release. We don't punish, but we pardon. We don't become an enemy, but we erase and look for ways to speak life into the moment. I dare you, the next time you have to deal with someone who's not practicing being unified, the next time you have to deal with someone who's obstinate and arrogant and playing the part of Satan and being malicious to you and mean to you and cold to you, I dare you to pray. Ask God to do good to those people. Ask God to bless them. Why in the world would you do that? Because you because you get to be the part, you get to play the part of Jesus. See, there's only two parts you can play. You can play the part of Jesus, you can play the part of Satan. And what Jesus does, it, it, watch what Jesus does. Jesus says to his brother, I'll do whatever I can. I'll give whatever I can. I will die for you. That's Jesus. Satan says it's all about me. The, the enemy says it's all about me. I'll do what I want to do. It's all about what I want. It's about my glory. It's about my agenda. And many people who struggle with power, many people who struggle with being obstinate, many people who struggle with ego, many people who struggle being rude, they want it to be all about them. They want the name. They want the glory. They want the power. They want this. They want that. And let Jesus be what rules your heart. And when you can do that, you can look your enemy in the face and smile and say like your Lord, Father, forgive him. They have no idea what they're doing. God, I pray that you bless them with good things. I pray that you give them peace. I pray that you help them to realize that I am for them, not against them. I pray that you help them to step into the best version of themselves. God, I pray that you grant them prosperity. I pray that you help my enemy to love you to see you, to know you, and to be like you. God, I pray that you allow them to flourish. And watch what God says. When you can learn how to pray for your enemy, because remember, your enemy is still your brother. They're just not at the table. God created every person breathing. Every person breathing belongs to God. So I would never wish ill on anyone who's made in the image of God, whether they're at the table or not. And when you can pray that way for your enemy, you realize that that is what God wants you to do. And then you will receive good things from your God. That's why Peter says, this is why you were called. We're called to be ambassadors of true forgiveness. And that's where we inherit our blessing. Listen, we've gone over six things that will help us to be a church, help us to be a people who practice unity, who can demonstrate what love through the manifestation of a unified church looks like. And those six things that we see in order for us to do it is we've got to be harmonious. We must be sympathetic. We must practice being brotherly. We must be kind hearted. We must be humble and we must forgive. And in doing so, we look just like our Lord. We act just like our Lord. We think just like our Lord. We become just like our Lord. Hear Peter say again, to sum all of it up, be harmonious, be sympathetic, be brotherly, be kind-hearted, be humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose, that you might inherit 
a blessing. Listen, I'm going to pray for you and I'm asking you, please pray for me and let's watch our God change everything around us. God bless you and God keep you. Yeah. Hello, family. Let us not forget what our purpose is. The purpose of the Roosevelt Freeport Church of Christ is to accomplish the great commission of Christ through intentional leadership and the ongoing development of kingdom focused followers of Jesus. That's all of us. The mission, therefore, of the church is to fulfill its purpose through evangelizing the world, equipping disciples, encountering God, and empowering servants. That's our mission. We thank you for your participation. We thank you for your excited gesture and worship pattern during this COVID time. But that's our mission. Let's look at it. Let's ingest it. Let's embody it because that's who we are here on earth in this community representing Jesus. All of our effort, beginning from the preacher, the elders, to every member of this congregation, it is to embody this purpose, this mission of the Church of Christ here in Roosevelt. If we're not accomplishing that, then we are selling Christ short. Remember, we are to embody him. We ought to be like him. We ought to smile like him. May God bless you. Let us pray. Father, we honor you and bless you for who you are. We thank you for being our God, but we also want to thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We also want to take the time to thank you for the Holy Spirit that continues to guide us and comfort us in everything that we do. So thank you, Father. Thank you for our congregation. Thank you for our elders. And thank you for your word. And we love you and honor you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Oh, Lord, my God. Sometimes I wonder when I look at the world that you have made. I see the stars, I hear the roll, rolling thunder.
at your cross, there's forgiveness at your cross, there is mercy at your cross, there is love.